Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here among all of you. I was here about two, two to two and a half years ago for six for several months. And over the years my appreciation for Krishna House has increased more and more. It's one of the most vibrant outreach centers, not just in America but all over the world, especially for outreach for Westerners. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to serve Kalkan Prabhu. Thank you. So today I'll speak on this topic of the mysterious relationship between appearance and substance in spiritual life. How, what, how one looks and how one is. What is the relationship between that? I'll take this class in three parts. First, I'll talk about four quadrants based on this, which you can visualize. And then I'll talk, uh, then I'll talk about how different souls fall in different quadrants and how we need to conduct ourselves. That will be the last part. So, substance is who one actually is. Appearance is how one looks. So, based on these two, we can have four quadrants. There is no substance, no appearance. There is no substance, but appearance is there. There is appearance, but no substance. And there is appearance and substance. So, here we have the pastime of Bharat, Ma Bharat Maharaj who has now become Jad Bharat. And which quadrant does he fall in? Substance, Substance but no appearance. Yeah. He's spiritually very advanced, but he looks like a even a materially uncultured person. He would not be very conscious about the way he looked. And he saw, when Rahogan saw him, he would not just look like a a poor person, but he seemed to be just like a uncultured person. And but the king actually commanded him, you know, assist me in lifting my palanquin. So there is, <clears throat> we all, there is a basic respect which we are meant to offer everyone. At the same time, there is a respect as a human being, as a spirit, as a soul, but there is also respect that is proportionate to what a person is. Respect is both universal and reciprocal. Universal in the sense that everybody deserves respect as a human being. <coughs> but at the same time, say if a discussion is going on between different people, it is not that everybody's opinion is equally valid. Some person might have studied that subject very deeply, might have a lot of experience and wisdom and realizations. And then their, their thoughts need to be given weight. So their thoughts will be given greater respect. So respect is universal. Nobody should be made to feel as if uh, they are worthless or they are foolish or something like that. But at the same time, not everybody's opinion can be given the same weight. So respect is reciprocal. Reciprocal means if somebody has uh, earned the respect, then they get more respect. The same applies in spiritual life. In spiritual life, we at one level learn to see every person as a spiritual being and we understand everybody is dear to the Supreme Lord. So at that level, we offer respect to everyone. We need to be kind and uh, gentle. And one of the qualities that Krishna says endears devotees to him is Advesta Sarva Bhutana Maitra Karuna Evacha. In 12.13 he says that uh, my devotees should be friendly toward everyone non-envious and friendly toward everyone. So that is, respect is to be offered to everyone. At the same time, if somebody is spiritually advanced, then greater respect needs to be offered to them. So with this background, let's look at these four quadrants. So some people, they have no, let's, the first quadrant is, what is the first quadrant? No appearance, no substance. So. These people, they don't look spiritually advanced and they have no spiritual advancement. They just don't care. I mean, they are just, they are just worldly. And that's what they are pursuing in their life. So such people, often by their, uh, it's, well, because the appearance and substance are the same, it's easy to understand. Now, they also need to be respected. But the respect we give them is, we give them an opportunity so that they can learn about Krishna in a, in a, in a conducive, comfortable way. And in one sense, the Madhyam Adhikari, 
the middle level devotee it is said that the middle level devotee makes distinctions that is प्रेम ईश्वर तदग्नेशु बालिशेशु दुषेत्सुचा प्रेम मैत्री कृपोपेक्षा यह करोति समध्यमा सो दोस हु आर हैव नो मटेरियल सब्सटेंस और नो मटेरियल अपीयरेंस बोथ दे कैन इधर बी इनोसेंट एंड इग्नोरेंट और दे कैन बी एनवीएस एंड मैलेबलेंट सो इफ दे आर एनवीएस एंड मैलेबलेंट कीप अ डिस्टेंस फ्रॉम देम इफ दे आर इनोसेंट ट्राई टू बी कंपैशनेट टू देम एक्चुअली इन बोथ केसेस अ डिवोटी इज कंपैशनेट but for those who are envious mm. the best way to offer them any compassion is by keeping a distance from them mm. otherwise they will be more offensive and i'll talk about this concept of offense a little later but this kind of distinctions have to be made so if there's no appearance there's no substance then either compassion or distance mm. then we have the second quadrant will be what okay. no no second quadrant will be appearance but no substance we'll come to third one here Which in either way, second and third can be interchangeable, but let's look at this way. So appearance, but no substance. This is where people often often put on a facade. If they are in a spiritual a circle that that respects some kind of spirituality, then they put on a facade so that they can earn some respect. People will respect them. So for many such people, their practices. Uh, they are uh, their practices are not so much uh, having a spiritual purpose as a social purpose. Hmm. They want to socially look good, so their spirituality is like a cosmetic. They wear the cosmetic so that they will look good in society, right? <laughs> <laughs> And usually. we come to know about such people when we we come to know the reality of such people if we spend some time with them because a mask cannot be kept on forever sooner or later the mask slips and then so that's why now many people fall in this category and this is the category of people who often alienate other people from spirituality those who put on a facade but they don't have the substance i was in a, a couple of years ago i was in texas i was going for a program and there i saw on a car bumper somebody had written oh god please save me from your creatures <laughs> so, normally god saves us through his creatures <laughs> but if the preachers are holier than thou if they are hell and brimstone kind of preachers <laughs> condescending then i just don't want anything to do with them so they may have the appearance they think they are very spiritual but the substance of kindness compassion and spirituality are not there so this can be quite alienating once it is exposed but till then it can be quite deceiving if it's not exposed so either way in that substance is not good so we need to be careful to discern if somebody is just at that level then the third level is appearance is no appearance but substance now why would somebody be like this at a broad level you could say it's because they don't care for this world we live especially when we are practicing spiritual life we there is a tension between this world and the next world for a spiritualist the next world is the ultimate reality and that is what we are aspiring for so some spiritual paths hold that the other world is all that matters and this world is a place of illusion entanglement and just give it up just turn away from it so these are more renunciation centered spiritual paths so those on such a spiritual path they become apathetic toward this world and when people live in this way they may not care at all for their externals for how they appear in this world now there are if we consider the broad traditions of the world spirituality can be approached in two distinct ways one is by t- 
turning away from the world towards some higher world or by walking through this world but with the eyes fixed on the other world. So we see this world as a path to the other world or we see this world as a roadblock to the other world and we turn away from the world. So the Jnana Marga in the Vedic tradition, the Jnana and Yoga Margas, those which involve meditation and philosophical speculation, they are world rejecting. Right? This world is false and go toward the other world. <coughs> the Karma Marga, the Karma, Karma Yoga and the Bhakti Marga, the Bhakti Yoga. These paths, broadly there are four paths in the Vedic tradition, Karma, Jnana, Yoga and Bhakti. So the Bhakti Marga is also, it sees this world and the other world as integral because both ultimately come from the Supreme Lord. And that's why Bhakti is what you could say engaged spirituality. That we engage in this world but in a way that we strive for engagement without entanglement. And for that our vision needs to be fixed on Krishna. Otherwise, the engagement will lead to entanglement. So generally, as devotees, we try to be in the fourth quadrant. Not that we put on an appearance, but the idea is that we want to serve Krishna in such a way that not only we move toward Krishna, that we, but we also attract others to move toward Krishna. And people in general go by appearances. <clears throat> There are sayings which, since in traditional wisdom also, apart from scriptural or spiritual wisdom, the sayings, they, they don't judge a book by its cover. It's a saying, but anybody who has published a book knows that people will judge the book by the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so, the cover design is one of the most important things for the sale of a book. So, so it's just natural because we is not necessary that people are superficial that is also a possibility but but another possibility is also that everybody has so many things to think about so many things to take in so unless something's appearance looks interesting looks attractive looks worth giving one's attention to people will just slip on to other things so Prabhupada said that dress before you address that doesn't mean that we dress in a fashionable way but we dress in a respectable way that people when we interact with them people feel that okay maybe this person is worth listening to I think they have something worthwhile to say to me so the appearance and substance in the bhakti path we try to have both together so this is the four quadrant analysis this was the first part of the talk the second is that I'll come back to this a little later again with respect to offenses. But now let's focus on the third quadrant, which is where Jad Bharat is right now. So why might one not care for the th for appearance at all? It's because they don't care for this world. And at one level, this not caring is being apathetic. But another is Jad Bharat is that he had got entangled in the world. <coughs> he had renounce the world for practicing spiritual life a wholehearted devoted spiritual life he had lived responsibly and respectably as a king and then he had renounced and then somehow he got attached to what a deer you now a deer became dear to him <laughs> and a deer became more dear than the supreme lord and thus he got distracted he got attached to a deer at the and he remembered the deer at the time of his death and he, he got the body of a deer. So of course now it was a cat catastrophe that after renouncing everything it's like say somebody fights a big some there's a, some great hero he fights a big war and again with very difficult odds single-handedly over overpowers a huge army and is about to conquer the fort and while entering into the fort he falls into a small ditch breaks his neck and dies 
what an anti climax <laughs> so it was almost like that he had renounced the whole world and he was he was already started experiencing the bhav it is spiritual love initial phase of spiritual love and from there he got attached to a deer so was it that everything was lost there are two principles in spiritual life that one is the law of last thought what krishna talks about in 85 and 86 in the bhagavad gita that whatever we remember that's what we will attain at the time of death and because he remembered a deer he got a deer's body but there is another principle that krishna says neha vikrama nasho sti pratyavayo na vidyate in 240 he says that those who that whatever spiritual advancement you make it's never lost then how are how are these two to be reconciled he was already very spiritually advanced but he remembered a deer at the time of death so there are some some situations where the material and spiritual join together but sometimes the material and spiritual operate on separate tracks what does it mean the material and spiritual operate on separate tracks that means that what we remember at the time of death that we will attain it is a material law and if it's a material law that's going to work so at a material level because he got attached to a deer's body he got a deer's body at a spiritual level his consciousness had developed attraction towards transcendence and that attraction was not lost that attraction always remained with him so that's why he got a deer's body but he didn't get deer's consciousness even in a deer's body he remembered that his previous lives like when not just the incidents from his previous life he actually remembered especially his spiritual journey and what deviated him from the spiritual journey so this was a blessing i have written a book on reincarnation and there are about 25 cases of children remembering their past lives maybe a 3 4 year old child suddenly comes one day to his mother and says mom mom where's my other mom this what and the, the children have past life uh, they have recollections then they have recognitions they are taken over there they actually recognize the people not only that then there are past life behaviors a small 3 year old boy a uh, small 4 5 year old boy he claims to be a man from a previous life and he has children from his previous life who are now in this life taller and older than him but when he sees them he starts ruffling their hair and <laughs> patting them as if they are his kids there are behaviors and there are birthmarks and birth defects where if somebody has a fatal wound from a previous life and died because of a fatal wound say a bullet entered into their body from here and came out from here then the next life they have birthmarks on the exact same points where they had the fatal wound in the previous life so there is it's very significant evidence that this whole idea of past life is quite real but after i wrote this book i revisited those cases to check how many of these children who remember their previous lives actually became spiritual it was very few hardly any of them they just remembered yes i had a previous life but they went on with this life so it is not just recollection some people some of us may feel oh if i could remember my previous life then i could get get a conviction that i am a soul and i could practice spiritual life with greater determination it's possible but it's not necessary because ultimately more important than our recollection is our intention even if somebody remembers something from the past still that does not necessarily mean that it will reorient us so even in our own lives there are so many things which you experienced and we may remember say we may remember that uh, if i overeat i feel miserable but still next time that temptation comes and what happens sarva dharman parityajya maya mekam sharanam braj we may succumb to the temptation again so it's not so much a matter of recollection as a matter of intention so he got the remembrance of his previous life because he had that strong intention but there have been a temporary deviation temporary deviation then after so now 
and so he when he went through this at the level of the at the at the material level he got a dear's body at a spiritual level he did not lose his spiritual consciousness so that's why i said the material and spiritual can sometimes operate in parallel so if somebody is diabetic and say like govardhan puja is a big festival with lot of deserts and somebody it's oh this is krishna's mercy this is govardhan not different <laughs> and they eat a lot of deserts i say i was remembering krishna well yes and yes it is prasad will it not purify me yes prasad will purify at the spiritual level but at a material level because it is a desert it will have its effects so we can, <laughs> so the point here is the material and spiritual go in parallel if i was only concerned about prasad if i see only spiritual why would i eat only deserts i could eat so many other soft food also but so so what happens just because we are practicing bhakti doesn't mean that we can demand or expect that krishna change the rules of the game for us material life operates by certain principles so those are the rules of the game krishna doesn't change the rules of the game for us if somebody uh, one of my friends recently was driving me super fast they were like way way above the speed limit and i told him please slow down he said no no krishna will protect us <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so i remembered what what something similar had happened long ago so one senior devotee had told me that hey, whenever devotee tried driving above the speed limit so i tell them when you go above the speed limit krishna leaves the car <laughs> <laughs> krishna leaves the car so means, if we are going to make a mistake we can't expect krishna to come and protect us so the idea is that we don't demand that krishna change the rules of the game for us in the bible there is a incident that when jesus is fasting for 40 days up in a mountain cave so the devil comes over there and the devil says you are telling everyone that god will protect you so of course god will protect you so okay jump down from this hill into the valley and let us see if god protects you and jesus says i will not jump down why he said don't you have faith god will protect you he says god will protect me but i am not going to demand his protection so i will not jump down if you push me down god will protect me if you push me down it's not that a devotee goes out of the way to court danger it's sometimes in the course of service danger may come and then we can see krishna's protection so jay bharat got jay bharat maharaj got materially attached and he had that deviation as he remembered his previous life and he lived even the dear's life very spiritually living near sages hearing the sacred vedic chants and now he has got a new body where he is in a brahmanical family uh, but he lives in a way that won't attract respect in this world because he thinks that if i get respect in this world then that will captivate me that will make me start thinking oh this respect is so pleasant so delightful and then that may distract me from the spiritual world so he doesn't want any entanglement in the world so he is not manifesting any appearance of spiritual advancement because he lived in a culture where spiritual advancement would be respected and he didn't want that respect so that's why he was in that situation and he so he manifests extreme caution so now for in our tradition also there are some some devotees who we can call it avdhuts avdhuts are people who just don't care for this world at all and they may be spiritually advanced but they are completely materially apathetic and that is if we associate with them we need to respect them. so how how do we do that in this case maharaj rahugun the king rahugun made a big mistake he commanded and disrespected this great spiritually advanced person whom he now realized to be spiritually advanced when jad bharat spoke spiritual wisdom so the way best way to function is that we respect everyone that we try to respect everyone as at a basic level and as and even if we are in a position of authority 
that doesn't give us a right to disrespect anyone so if we treat everyone at least at the basic level of human courtesy then we want of we decrease the chances of offending anyone beyond that if somebody is practicing spiritual life then we need to be uh, even more careful with them so this brings me to the last part this so second part was why why is somebody in the third quadrant of no appearance but substance and then we talk about how do we conduct ourselves so at one level we try to conduct ourselves in the fourth quadrant because i said we are a part of a movement that is for outreach we want to practice bhakti in this world so that we go beyond this world but we also attract others to go beyond this world and shila prabhupad when he was asked how can we identify your followers so prabhupad said they are perfect gentlemen and ladies it's interesting and very revealing prabhupad did not say they wake up in the morning they chant 16 rounds they follow four regs all these are important but this was a journalist asking in an interview and the world doesn't care uh, what uh, what what time we wake up or what spiritual practices we do what the world cares is how we behave so a post modern attitude is and it is one part of post modernism which is which is which is sound that is don't tell me what you believe show me how you behave everybody can have their ideologies and with post modernism now with internet available any philosophy if you want to find out faults you can just google and find out this problem this problem this problem yeah. so if we just try to you just to tell this is the right thing don't tell me what you believe but show me how you behave shila prabhupad he gave he was very philosophical in his classes but at the same time at a one to level one level he was so personal and kind and loving and that's what attracted people so as far as devotees we may be we may not we may our goal may be beyond this world but we need to function in this world also and that's why as prabhupada said be gentlemen and ladies that means behave in a way that is respectable having said that that we behave in a respectable way but while dealing with others even if others don't seem to behave in a respectable way they seem to be in strange ways so it's best that we give others benefit of doubt i'll conclude with this point that generally there is a tendency is very common human tendency to gossip <laughs> when does gossip happen usually it happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like <laughs> 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 we hear something we like about someone we don't like how oh, really this person puts up <laughs> so now uh, more often than not in in the gossip there is some truth but there is a lot of falsity also that's why we need to be careful about whenever we hear something negative about someone if at all is disturbing us go and ask someone senior and respectable authority to don't talk it up with everyone if we have a relationship go and talk with that person directly and clarify but if you can't talk with that person talk with somebody else who knows them well and then get a clearer understanding that way we can avoid being judgmental and offensive and then we can progress smoothly in our bhakti avoiding the danger of offenses as is pointed out in this verse so i'll quickly summarize I spoke today on this topic of uh, the relationship between appearance and substance in spiritual life. Talked about four quadrants: no appearance, no substance. That's when people are materialist and don't care about spirituality. Appearance, but no substance. That is when they are materialist, but they want to put on a facade of spirituality. No appearance, but substance. That is when they don't care for this world at all. And then appearance and substance is when they we want to when they want to go to other world, but also. take this world along with them towards the other world so i talked about why jad bharat was in the like third quadrant because he was extremely cautious he had been deviated in the previous life and he got deviated because although he had been spiritually advanced he got attached to a deer so 
just because we are practicing spiritual life doesn't mean that Krishna will change the rules of the game for us. We have to be cautious and responsible. And as far as our functioning is concerned, we understand that respect is universal and reciprocal. Universal in the sense that everybody needs to be respected as a human being. And reciprocal means if somebody is spiritually advanced, then we respect them more. So the best way we can stay in the fourth quadrant is by having basic respect for everyone. And whenever somebody is practicing spiritual life, if we see them behaving in a non-respectable way, then we give them the benefit of doubt. Instead of gossiping, we clarify and thus we avoid the danger of offense. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Do we have a few minutes? Okay, yes, please. So, uh, thank you for that. That's wonderful. Um, in the example of Jabbar, he tolerates so many offenses to um, his own, uh, you know, his own uh, conception of self, you know, um, and he doesn't heed it any mind, you know. Um, and I was wondering, uh, within our own lives, um, when we want to defend our false ego. Um, against, you know, supposed offenses or insults, is that in any way detrimental to our spiritual lives? Okay. Or practice bhakti. So, if we want to, if we, when we feel offended, should we try to defend ourselves? Is that detrimental to bhakti? Not necessarily detrimental. We have to see what works best for us. At one level, we all are required to tolerate. That's what we are told. Tarora Pisahishnuna. Learn to tolerate. But on another level, we are also told Amanina Manadena. Give respect to others. So that means we want to create a culture where there is caring and respectfulness for respect for everyone. And we all want to develop humility. But it is not that if if we go around insulting everyone, it's not that they're going to become humble. It's not going to work. Humility is something just like a conscious decision. It cannot be a social imposition. If it's a social imposition, then what happens is not humility, but humiliation. It is, humility is when there is the false ego, but we care for something bigger than the ego. I care for my service. I care for my relationship with Krishna. And that is more important than my ego. But... Having said that, we need to make sure that we have a culture where everyone is valued and respected. And if we are feeling devalued by someone, then we need to do the needful. Sometimes if a person is habitually disrespectful to everyone, we may need to report. Otherwise, we need to defend ourselves. Defend means not in a conflicting sense, but just clarify. Sometimes people accept, sometimes they don't accept. So broadly, we shouldn't think that when we are clarifying, it's always defending. We can see what is what is my purpose. Just as if we are feeling very cold, then we put on some warm clothes so that we can comfortably maybe chant or do our service. What applies at the level of the body physically also applies at the level of emotions. If you are feeling too hurt, then we can't focus on our service. So we need a basic level of emotional security and comfort also. And occasionally, if there is somebody who speaks something or does something which hurts us, we can tolerate. But if it's regularly happening, then we need to we need to do the needful to protect ourselves so that we can focus on our spirituality. So sometimes it might be just we clarify and the other person understands. Sometimes some people are just that they are, they just no matter what we do, they always speak negative about us. Then in that case, we just need to shift our focus. We need to, we shouldn't overvalue those who devalue us. And we should value those who value us. So, in, in sometimes if you can't change the other person, then just keep a distance from them. Don't take their words so seriously. But to be able to do that, we should have some other people who value us. Not in the egoist, not that flattering us, but just giving us the basic respect and uh, basic, uh, basic courtesies so that we can go on our life. Then we focus more on connecting with them and then we learn to live with them. In all our relationships, there are some people, some people say who bring happiness wherever they go. And some people bring happiness whenever they go. 
<laughs> so if the people in the second category become more than in the first category that means the people who exhaust us and interacting with them become more than the people who enliven us then we will not be emotionally stable so we we need the the relationships where we are enlivened and encouraged that's how we can move on in our lives okay thank you yes sir So I was wondering about uh, yeah these I feel like I've been a little bit in a uh, in the category of like you know um, looking good but no substance for some time and because that's also uh, yeah appreciated I guess when we get more mature in our society then we don't look so much at the external so much and we are more uh, considering the substance. Okay. Um, so, anyways, I played that game for a bit, faked it to make it, um, but you know it doesn't last so long. So now I'm a little bit like like the pendulum swings on the other side, where I'm like uh, I try to work on the substance more than the external. But again, it's not really uh, ideal. Ideally, you want to have both substance and external. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes. We try to put on the externals, even in our spiritual life, and then we get tired and we don't care for the externals, <laughs> wanting thinking that I'll work only on the internals. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be necessary like that. And if say if we are working on the externals, it is also a sign of not we are not necessarily making a show of spiritual advancement. There is always going to be a difference between internals and externals, unless we are we are pure devotees. So basically, in, there could be different possibilities. Why is the difference between external and internal there? If there are externals without any desire for the internals at all, then that's hypocrisy. If there are externals with the desire for the internals, even if they are not present, then that is discipline, that is culture, and that is an austerity. We, all of we we can't see each other's thoughts. desires emotions and that is a great blessing <laughs> <laughs> if you could start seeing you just thoughts that you think like this you have this kind of desires you feel this about me <laughs> not a single relationship could be sustained <laughs> so actually nature has given us you could say some kind of buffer by which Our, we can keep our internals in unhealthy internals inside us and behave in a respectable way externally and that is civilized behavior so we shouldn't think that just because the internals are not there and the externals i am putting on that's hypocrisy that is if we have no intention of developing the internals but if we have the intention i feel really angry with someone and then also i try to be polite and smile at them because i want to be i don't want i don't want to be uncultured or if i'm polite and smiling so that they get their guard down and then i stab them <laughs> that is very <laughs> so that is bad but in general if we are at the level where it's a discipline or a culture then we shouldn't think that that is bad we try to have the external so that we can gradually develop the internals and somehow i don't like the word fake so we say that Uh, fake it till you make it we sometimes it said the better way to say is that sometimes we feel our way to actions we feel bhakti and then we chant we dance we do various services but most of the times we act our way to feelings we do the externals and gradually the internals come by that so it's not exactly faking it's cultivating so thank you very much great <laughs> ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की श्री प्रभुपाद की जय